Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about Halo. No, not that Halo, but the 802.11 AH wireless standard published in 2017. You may have heard of 802.11 A, B, G, N, A, C, or AX standards before when talking about Wi-Fi, and those standards will operate within the 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz wireless bands to deliver internet access around your home, workplace, or wherever else without wires. Really quickly, the difference between those two bands is 2.4 GHz is a lower frequency and can have an easier time passing through obstacles like walls compared to the higher frequency 5 GHz band. The speeds are often faster on 5 GHz than 2.4 GHz because there's more channels available, which means your Wi-Fi router can use more lanes to fit more of your internet traffic. 802.11ah, on the other hand, doesn't use 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. It uses 0.9 gigahertz, or 900 megahertz. This frequency band has about a third of the channel space as 2.4 gigahertz, so it can be slower. The lower frequency means it can pass through even more obstacles and across further distances than wireless standards using 2.4 gigahertz. Besides it running in the 900 megahertz band, the Halo standard is actually designed with a few priorities in mind to make it ideal for Internet of Things use cases. The protocol can support a lot more client devices, up to 8,191. There's power saving features implemented to allow client devices to run for long periods of time on battery power. Compared to other IoT-focused wireless standards like LoRa or Zigbee, Halo is especially nifty because it's a full Wi-Fi standard. You can pass regular network traffic through this at throughput measured in megabits when its competition is limited to stripped down, small bursts of sensor readings, button pushes, or whatever else going at throughput measured in kilobits. So this is nifty on paper, but since it was announced in 2016, what actual products have come out since? Well, not many. Seems like there's about three vendors making actual chipsets for these. Tyson Semiconductor, Morse Micro, and Neuracom. Neuracom's implementation supports only up to 4 MHz channel widths, limiting the total possible speeds, but the smaller channel sizes are ideal for longer distances. They seem to have done a lot of work testing different applications for it, as seen from their YouTube channel, where they demonstrated being used with lots of client devices, and testing coverage in different scenarios. Silex, one of Neuracom's partners, seems to have some modules available and a few Ethernet bridge type devices. Alpha seems to offer an outdoor access point with PoE, a USB receiver, and a Raspberry Pi hat that use this chipset, and they claim up to 6 megabits per second for those products. Morse Micro's chipset seems to be a bit more capable since it supports up to the 8 MHz channel widths, which will allow for faster speeds. There's also some other Alpha wireless products that use this chipset, and the product pages claim they're capable of up to 16 megabits per second of speed, which is a nice jump. I've also come across some demo modules for this chipset elsewhere. The last chipset I've been able to find is the TXW8301 by Tyson Semiconductor. These also allow for up to 8 MHz wide channels and 16 megabits of speed. Modules and devices using these chips have started popping up on places like AliExpress, so I picked up two separate kits because I can't help myself when it comes to buying cheap Chinese electronics on AliExpress. The first product is a very generic Ethernet bridge kit. The build quality isn't bad, the cables are similar to what you'd find on cheap surveillance cameras, and the enclosure seems well protected with a gasket on the lid and a bit of silicone around the cable hole. They include some small antennas with SMA connectors, but you could also choose to attach your own 900 MHz antennas if you want. Using directional antennas like these old 900 MHz panels or a cellular log periodic antenna instead of the included omnidirectional antennas would greatly increase the distance that you can get out of these. You power them using a 12 volt power brick or any other roughly 12 volt supply with a barrel jack connector, like this USB-C adapter and a power bank. It includes a power pass-through, probably for connecting to an IP camera, Wi-Fi AP, or some other device. The bridges came pre-paired out of the box and ready to use, so after connecting one end up to my network and the other to a laptop's network port, I was quickly able to establish a connection and get a speed test of around 16 megabits per second. Unlike most Wi-Fi bridges, configuring these isn't done through a nice web interface, but through some odd .exe files that seem to connect to the chipset by MAC address. One .exe file shows logs from the device about signal levels and other stats. 
and the other one allows you to send AT commands for changing configuration and getting the status of the device. I expect you could also issue these AT commands over serial if you tap into the serial lines on the PCB inside. As far as power consumption goes, these are very efficient. At idle or when downloading, I'm usually seeing a draw of about half a watt. When doing constant uploading, it's at about 0.8 watts. For comparison, a lot of the Wi-Fi bridges that I work with typically use anywhere from 3 to 20 watts. I get the feeling that the manufacturer is using the minimum amount of components to turn the off-the-shelf Halo module into a sellable product, and that a more developed product would probably integrate some sort of system on a chip that runs a web interface and exposes more of the features. In its current state, it's still pretty useful for getting network connectivity to places where traditional Wi-Fi won't reach, while having an affordable price and being completely plug-and-play. Next up, Angelio Smart Technology seems to sell a few different products based on this TXW8301 chipset. They make some video doorbells, cameras, and Wi-Fi bridges similar to the first product we looked at, but most interestingly, they make this thing. They're calling it a Wi-Fi extender because the AP side has a network port like you would expect, but the client device has no port. Instead, it has a built-in 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi access point. The idea is you connect the AP to your home network, bring the client device with you to your backyard, garage, or somewhere else where your regular Wi-Fi doesn't reach, and then you could connect your phone, laptop, or whatever else to the Wi-Fi network being broadcasted by the client. Powered by USB-C, so the remote side could plug into a power bank, a laptop's USB port, or even a phone to make it portable. As you might imagine, it weighs almost nothing with just a tiny PCB in the bottom and some small omnidirectional antennas inside the case. It does have what appears to be a UFL antenna port on the board, so you could probably find an SMA or N connector pigtail cable to replace the included antenna if you want. In the client device, besides the Halo chipset, there's a JH Tech SM2400 Wi-Fi chip that I couldn't find any data sheets for, but based on the Wi-Fi MAC address, it's also a Tyson semiconductor part. The board also has GH Tech printed on it, but when I did some searches, I couldn't actually find any sort of manufacturer that had the name or initials that would make a product like this. As for the software, I saw in the manual that they talked about a web configuration page, which got me excited, but it turns out it's purely for configuring the Wi-Fi access point settings and nothing else relating to the Halo wireless features. You can use the same weird exe files for the AT commands, but I was only able to access the device with the Ethernet port. Some of the equipment claims over a kilometer of range with the included omnidirectional antennas. I don't have a quiet spot where I can test that kind of range, but I do know of an old quarry where I can do about 310 meters or over a thousand feet. I also did a test at the family camp property to see how they did with obstacles. I was able to locally host a speed test with a Raspberry Pi and a jumble of other parts jammed into an ammo box in a manner that would probably be alarming to the general public if I just left it sitting somewhere with a weird antenna wired into it. I would have also preferred to use the more generic Halo bridge to get detailed stats like signal levels and so I could try out external antennas, but I ended up using the Angelio Smart Wi-Fi extender due to some last minute computer trouble. It ended up getting taped to a tripod leg on a bit of a hill while I ran the test from my laptop in the car. My first test was from about 10 meters, 32 feet away, and I was pulling down the full 16 megabits. I moved to about 90 meters, 295 feet away, and I was still getting 16 megabits. At around 185 meters, or 609 feet, speeds were going down very slightly, and I was seeing about 14 to 15 megabits. A little further down the quarry at 250 meters, or 820 feet, still with line of sight, I was getting 11 to 14 megabits per second. The last test location was at the 310 meter or 1017 feet mark and that put me behind a 40 foot patch of small trees blocking the line of sight completely. These conditions brought the speeds down to between 8 and 12 megabits and again keep in mind these tests were done with the client unit inside my car going through the glass and being surrounded by metal. When I was up at the family camp property recently, I brought the Angelio Smart Wi-Fi extenders and the Raspberry Pi running the speed test with me, and I decided to do some very unscientific testing. I hooked the base unit to the Wi-Fi router indoors in the corner of the building. I definitely needed to use the Pi speed test server here because my cellular internet there is very weak and I really only get 2 megabits on the best of days despite using a roof-mounted antenna and modem. My first test with the Angelio Smart Wi-Fi Extender was a good example of what this product could be used for. We built a small cabin about 30 feet from one side of the main building, but with the Wi-Fi router on the opposite side of that main building, the signal is very weak inside the cabin. 
by just plugging in the AP side of the extender system into the main router and bringing the client side over the cabin, I now had a solid 10 megabits. In hindsight, I think there might have been something up with the network cable during these tests since it was oddly consistent at 10 megabits and it probably could have been better there. I started walking through the wooded part of the property, and at about 75 meters or 250 feet, I still had a stable connection and was getting about 10 megabits down and 5 up. I kept walking until I got to the far end of the path, about 140 meters or 460 feet, with a lot of dense trees in the way, and I was still getting nearly 2 megabits down, and the latency was starting to get higher and there was some jitter too, but it was stayed connected and I expected that still faster than what I could get through the cell data. After playing with the two products using the Halo standard, I think it's another useful tool for delivering wireless networks. In its current form, the speeds are more than enough for things like IP cameras, sensors, and basic internet access. So far, we've only seen fairly simple implementations of it. All of the available chipsets are only using a single spatial stream, and having a chipset that supports two, like most Wi-Fi devices, could double the speeds that I've gotten testing, which could make the smaller channel sizes even more capable. All that said, uh, do I believe this should be a mass market product and should be included in every home router out there? No. But I could definitely see the standard and the currently available chipsets ending up in products that are designed to be used at longer distances beyond what typical Wi-Fi is capable of. Things like outdoor cameras, uh, gate controllers, intercom systems, or cordless VoIP phones. The increased range will allow for some interesting deployments and greatly reduce the cost to cover a large area when only basic speeds are needed. Most households are going to be adequately covered by regular 2.4 and 5 GHz Wi-Fi, and the Wi-Fi 6 standard actually implements implements the target wait times from 802.11ah to reduce power consumption for things like IoT devices. The 900 MHz band is pretty small, so having more devices using more chatty protocols like Halo in every home could also lead to a lot of unnecessary congestion with that band. If you're trying to bring fast network access to remote building, systems using 5 GHz and 2.4 GHz like Ubiquiti Air Max, KBM EPMP, or Microtix wireless equipment will do a much better job than Halo when you have a clear line of sight. That said, none of these brands have a 900 megahertz option anymore. Cambium was the last holdout, but they recently killed their 900 megahertz product, so Halo could still be ideal for this use case if you're trying to get a signal through a bunch of trees or something. One thing that these other 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bridge products aren't designed for is mobile applications. I think Halo Ethernet bridges like the ones we tried out today could be a really handy product if you have a larger property like a farm, construction site, park, or campground with bad cell service and you want an easy way to stay connected as you move around. You could bring the client with you in a vehicle, maybe with a roof mounted antenna, and drive around the property while being able to stream Spotify, send messages, and use Wi-Fi calling or push the talk voice service services like Zello. Private LTE and 5G systems are starting to become more popular in farming, industrial sites, and other applications where wide area mobile data is needed. Governments are allocating 3 GHz spectrum for these systems, but those licenses have a recurring cost and cellular technologies like LTE are pretty complicated and expensive to set up, often requiring powerful servers to run all the backend EPC and other acronyms. Whereas Halo is unlicensed, completely standalone, and simple like regular Wi-Fi is. Sure, 3 GHz LTE can perform a lot better than 16 megabits, but if the goal is two people and tractors can use Wi-Fi calling, then private LTE might be a bit overkill. I think I've only scratched the surface when it comes to what you can use this technology for. I haven't seen much discussion about it online, and I practically stumbled across it by accident despite working with wireless technologies as my day job. If you've used Halo equipment or have any nifty ideas for it, definitely leave a comment about your experience. Maybe I'll do uh, more testing and see how it works with different applications like VoIP or video streaming. That's all I have for now, so have a good day.